How are you guys doing? Good. Sleepy. Ready for, I guess, for a drink, right? Oh, yeah. uh, getting tired, everybody. Yes, it's been a long day, but uh, we're very excited to have all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Alex and I we wanted to share uh, a summary of uh, the collaboration that uh, uh, Itirisk started uh, with the uh, Protofire team and uh, the uh, the plans and the use cases that we have for uh, making decentralized insurance uh, cheaper, faster, and uh, better for the consumer. Uh, we're gonna uh, share the use cases. I will uh, uh, talk about the requirements that we have uh, from a decentralized uh, insurance product uh, perspective. Uh, and at risk, I'm. Uh, 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 I care about the products and revenue and getting the products to market and uh, the, the qualities of, of the, those products uh, are very important. So, uh, Alex uh, will uh, talk about um, uh, something like what's under the hood of uh, rate making, uh, applying machine learning for uh, risk uh, pricing, for pricing the risk policies. All right, so the... Uh, the use cases for, uh, for the decentralized um, insurance and the intersection with machine learning, they come from the change we would like to make uh, to the products uh, or insurance products of the future. Uh, the, uh, the promise of uh, decentralization, uh, it's very clear to us at Etrisk that it has a potential to deliver a provably fair insurance where the alignment of interest between the insurers and the uh, insurance company is, uh, is provably fair. Uh, anyone can inspect uh, the smart contract that uh, 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 provides the service and uh, the funds and a lot of uh, things that happen in the back end, they're also open source. So uh, we also think that the uh, the regulation uh, of uh, insurance, essentially it makes the uh, insurance, uh, what I call a government uh, sanctioned monopoly. And uh, uh, with decentralization, some uh, users of uh, future insurance products, sometimes they may just interact directly with a smart contract. And uh, we believe that different uh, drivers uh, for the decentralized insurance, they require uh, qualities that machine learning uh, may uh, potentially bring uh, to the table. Uh, the, the key use case for, uh, for machine learning in insurance has been always in the, uh, in the rate making, determining the price um, and um, uh, figuring out the premium. The uh, emerging use cases include uh, claims adjustment and they include uh, fraud, fraud detection. Uh, these are the two interesting use cases where machine learning can uh, bring the, uh, the superpowers to the smart contracts in a uh, relatively uh, uh, inexpensive uh, way and uh, placed behind, for example, an oracle uh, or uh, any trusted data feed uh, scenario, they can provide an aid to uh, a decentralized claim management system that we heard this morning was uh, proposed uh, by Mahat. And um, uh, the use cases, we currently see three major use cases for machine learning in uh, decentralized insurance, uh, which is pricing, claims management, and fraud detection. Um, primarily in the property casualty space where we are uh, working on building products and uh, the data sources that uh, we consider using, the, our requirements are that it might be pretty much anything that uh, the data source might come in, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, the time to market for building something uh, with uh, machine learning uh, is uh, 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 is greatly has been greatly reduced over the last uh, five, uh, seven years, and the technologies became uh, very affordable for uh, for even small teams to, to build something useful. Um, and uh, right now we are uh, exploring various uh, emerging technologies that include a deep learning library like TensorFlow. Have anyone heard about TensorFlow? Wow, almost everybody. Great. We find uh, the uh, the qualities uh, 
uh, capability is offered by TensorFlow attractive in particular because it's, uh, it's built for uh, mobile first um, uh, world where the, uh, the products uh, and the models that are uh, built with uh, TensorFlow they can uh, work on the mobile devices even without the internet and that is something that for example IBM Watson uh, can't do uh, it cannot work somewhere in the field and uh, uh, run the model on the uh, uh, Android device, for example, right? And uh, it has also different qualities, and I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, features, uh, but I will uh, explain how, uh, how we see the, the training process. Uh, and it's, it's very simple. Um, from a, from a, a product management perspective, we need to have some data sets. And once we have the data sets, we can uh, take these uh, data sets and uh, uh, feed it into a model. And uh, thanks uh, to the pre-trained models available in the market, uh, the model uh, can take the image data or text uh, data or voice. And uh, then uh, it will uh, train. Uh, and following that process, once it's complete, we can test whether the, the model works or not. If it works, then great, we can continue to improving it by uh, fine-tuning the parameters or, uh, and or uh, giving, obviously, more data, right? Uh, if uh, we feed upon training uh, a piece of data, let's say an image that uh, the model hasn't seen before and it doesn't work very well, then we're doing something wrong when we uh, switch and do something else using a completely different tool set. So, um, one of the most uh, interesting drivers that reduce the cost of uh, building uh, uh, working applications uh, with uh, uh, TensorFlow is availability of pre-trained models that uh, companies like Google uh, develop. They train them on, on, uh, on the large data sets. And um, uh, the key benefit of using pre-trained models, such as Inception V3, is that uh, you only need a very small set of data. For example, even a hundred or a few hundred images is enough to, to get the first results. And that is truly fascinating because traditionally uh, you, could, you couldn't do much uh, without huge gigantic data sets. So reduction of the uh, uh, requirements when it comes to the size, sheer amount uh, of the uh, data that you need to feed into the model, that has been reduced by thanks to having the pre-trained models that you just uh, see if, if they work or not. And the best approaches are uh, uh, today, uh, they, they go around trying very quickly as many uh, models uh, in as many settings with different tools as possible and see what works. So um, the time to market uh, greatly reduced by uh, having a choice of uh, tens of uh, different libraries and models that you can uh, choose to test and see if, it, if it's going to work with your data set. Um, here's an example of how we see a high level uh, architecture of, uh, 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 of, of doing uh, uh, fraud detection. Uh, for example, for an auto insurance uh, uh, use case. Uh, here we see that we will uh, take uh, about a thousand images of, uh, that we know that have not been manipulated with. And uh, then we take some images that uh, we know that uh, were manipulated with. We feed them into the inception with three model. Uh, we train the model uh, on, um, let's say, in the cloud and or on the local machines with GPUs, and we quickly can get a model to uh, learn from these data sets. And then once we once the training process is complete, we can immediately begin testing it by sending an image uh, of. Uh, 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 a damage that uh, one is, has not been manipulated with and one that has been manipulated with. And then we see the results, whether it's a fraud or not fraud. Right? And then the model can give us the percentage, what's, uh, how confident the model is in the prediction. Right? And that's how this process works. You just feed the data in, you then complete the, let the machine complete the training. Uh, TensorFlow can train on a distributed uh, uh, on a distributed network of multiple machines working together, just like Hadoop can can process a lot of different uh, data sets uh, all uh, all at the same time. And um, uh, 
one challenge that we see in applying it in a decentralized world is that uh, all of the infrastructure that's available for very fast uh, time to market is uh, centralized. And of course, uh, we would like to see how we can uh, uh, implement these, uh, both the training and then the serving, the process once the model training has been complete, it's called, you're now entering into the serving mode, right? So the model can serve. The, the ser serving of model requires uh, a compute uh, and it requires uh, storage. So we're looking forward to see the decentralized infrastructure maturing to the point where we could run uh, simple models uh, in a serving mode after they have been trained uh, uh, in a decentralized manner. Um, and that completes uh, my part. Uh, please welcome Alex. Hello everyone. Give me one sec to set my stuff up. Okay, so uh, I've brought this red card with me and every time I'm going to show it to you it means that there is math on the slide so you can just close your eyes, okay? <laughs> See, I care about you already. So imagine you're starting your own insurance company and you kind of wonder, well, what, what amount of premium you should charge your customers. Well, you can use some kind of a naive approach and say, well, let everyone pay you five bucks. How about that? Well, you see, um, that's where capitalism comes in, you know, models of capitalism. If someone is a bit smarter than you are and figured out that people sometimes are not equally, you know, do not equally represent the risk. For example, those purple guys, they're probably from the high risk group for some reason. So uh, they might lower the premiums for other customers and eventually your company is going to lose customers to the competitor. And well, it's gonna get worse. And well, at the end of this, you're not going to have, you know, balanced portfolio and stuff. So actually, that's quite common actuarial task in insurance to actually, you know, predict the pure premium, the price for the premium. And well, pure premium is the term, yet again, from the insurance world. It's it's easily, you know, can be interpreted as justified premium. It's like the amount of premium required to cover all the losses. It doesn't include any loading or profits and that stuff. It's just, you know, for the losses only. And machine learning can help with that. So imagine that we have a data set with properties of policies and in machine learning world we call them features and some kind of a target variable, which in this case is amount of covered claims. And then we kind of try to figure out the connection between the features and the target variable and make actual prediction. So before we actually build our model, let's take a look at the data. So just like I described to you like a minute ago, uh, on the left there is a table with features. This data set is actually for uh, car insurance, third party liability, uh, and this data set is available online to anyone. So it's from some French company. And so on the left there are features like driver age, car age, the population density in the region where the driver is living, exposure, which is actually a measure of time, like how long this guy has been insured. And on the right we have the amount, like the accumulated amount of claims covered for that policy. So in some cases there is zero if person didn't, well, didn't file a claim at all. And well, sometimes there is some money. Okay, so uh, the goal here, just like Renat said, we want to predict something based on those features, you know? We're not going to know the amount of claims for new customers, right? We cannot see the future, so the basic idea of a model is to find some kind of dependency and to rebuild this column on the right. However, there is a problem. Okay, so here is the red card, be warned. Okay, so if you remember high school math, there is a term called expected value. Actually, a couple of guys mentioned it today, but mm, to be really simple, imagine if you have a six-sided die and you're going to roll it like a hundred of times. Well, if you do that, you will probably find some kind of underlying, I don't know, dependency between, well, how many times you roll and the average value of dots on the face inside of the die. So I guarantee that if your die is actually balanced, you're not going to get something far away from 3.5, okay? So this value is a long time average among all observations. So that's the expected value. 
So uh, we can't, in our model, actually predict, even if we build a model for the dice roll, which is actually pretty simple, we can't predict the next value on the die. We can't see the future, right? But we can find some kind of dependency under it. We can actually check that, well, uh, each, each side of the die has like equal probability of showing, right? And that knowledge might be possible, like useful for us. The same can be said about expected value. That's, that's how the grouped insurance model works. So, before we feed the data to the machine learning algorithm, we actually need to do some pre-processing. And, well, those procedures are actually pretty complex, but basically, on the left, we have the age variable, and there are various numbers like 19 years old, 25 years old, and etc. So, we define three new features like uh, is your age between 18 and 22, is your age between 22 and 26, and etc. So basically it's like a series of yes and no questions, right? You, you can actually remember that when you come to insurance company to file your policy, they actually like give you the questionnaire with those features sometimes. Okay, so and we basically start to fill it in and only one of those features will be active at a time, right? You cannot be uh, simultaneously uh, of the age of, I don't know, 19 and 22, right? Only one of them is going to work. So we fill those out and that's how we get the data for the generalized linear model. Okay, be warned, there is some math. So this model uh, was actually proposed as a generalization of linear and logistic regression, if you can remember those terms yet again from some basic stats course. And it's, it has been used by actuaries for decades. It's like, I don't know, the primary tool in the analysis. And it's relatively simple to implement by your own hands and actually if you train this model you can easily deploy it and run it inside of a smart contract. It's basically one formula, you know, a single line, some basic matrix multiplication, but whatever. So uh, it can be, it also can be easily interpreted. And well, if you're interested in that scenario we are modeling, we're going to use Tweedy generalized linear model. So you can Google it after the talk if you're still interested. So you can check what, what exactly this model consists of. And well, just like I said, it can be easily interpreted. For example, this graph shows the weights assigned for each feature. Well, I obviously hit the names of the features because there are so many. But uh, some features, for example, features that, well, more than zero, they have the positive effect. They increase the predicted value for the premium. So those are basically risk groups. So um, in my case, for example, the model predicted that the highest risk uh, is posed by people who live in, well, densely populated regions, because obviously there are more cars, for example. And there are also weights which are below the zero, and they actually mean that, well, the risk decreases. For example, there are various age groups, I mean, very old drivers who just don't remember how to drive fast, you know, <laughs> they just can't damage themselves. And well, that's probably the most important question here is like, if I build the model, how do I know that it actually works? I mean, well, I want to start my insurance company and I'm not sure how, how should I drive the premium prices. Even if I build it, how do I know? Well, the truth is that all models are wrong. You just can't do this like in, in a very, very reliable way. There is always some percentage of risk here, right? You can increase your confidence, but the key feature here is that it's not about finding a true model under the data, it's about building several models and choosing the best one. So it's like a iterative process, you know? And there are lots of criteria available. Uh, well, I listed them on the slide, so yet again, you can Google them afterwards. They, they all actually, you know, prefixed with information criteria name. So each criteria has its own applicability conditions and this is where you know, statisticians start to fight between each other like, okay, I can validate the model with this criteria but it, well, someone else might disagree and say that it's not correct. So what I'm trying to say here is that this model is by no means the only risk, uh, risk defense. You, know, you need to have like, advanced layers like reinsurance and stuff on top of it. Because obviously one day it's going to break and if you don't want it to break you need to update it like, like frequently. So, um, here's the link to the source code. I basically built the very simple pure premium prediction model. It actually has all the steps uh, in the code. Let me just show you 
how it works. I'm actually very brave to run the code, but this is not my laptop, right? So I can't. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, how do you scroll on this? Okay. And I have all of this cached, actually. So, so uh, without like explaining too much of the code, there are basically uh, this is basically a Jupyter notebook. If you know what it is, it's the tool that uh, well data scientists use to kind of hack, hack their solutions and well try and check it and visualize it. So it's basically step-by-step -step script with some annotations and explanations of, of how exactly well the model works and stuff. And let me show you the plot in the end. It just doesn't scroll so fast. Okay, there's a bit different visualization of the model weights, well, annotated obviously, so we can see, for example, that this model thinks that the driver age between 42 and 74 is actually the safest one for some reason. It's not so far from 74 years old and older. So you get, you get the basic idea. So uh, you can also extract uh, the actual, I don't know, mathematical effect on the pure premium from each of those weights. That, that's really easy. And that's what will lead you to building, a, well, rating tables for your clients. So you will be able to reliably explain, like, why should I charge you more than five bucks? And why should I charge you less than five bucks? So that's basically it, I think. Let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so uh, there are links to some data sets in the presentation, so if you want to hack the solution by yourself, you can well, check them out. There are also some Python libraries available. Well, the source code was in Python, if you didn't notice. So uh, you can basically download those and we'll try to play with them. Well, scikit-learn is a very popular machine learning library and, well, the implementation is still in progress. And there are a couple of books that you will find useful. I mean, if you're just starting out with machine learning, the first one is hands-on machine learning and the second one is computational lectural science with R. Actually, not an easy read, but, well, you will find it quite fascinating. And, well, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alex. That's my part. <laughs> and thank you also. Protofire is one of the sponsors of this conference, so um, an applause to this too. And Altoros is also um, sponsoring this conference, and both both of you and a lot of the team in here is um, actually involved with Altoros, and we are very happy to to have you all here.